inside this pack is what is called the NES RGB component video board. It's another product made by eTim who made the NES RGB board for the NES and the N64 RGB board for the Nintendo 64 obviously. This, um, this kit here is used in conjunction with the NES RGB kit so it's not a standalone kit that will give you component video out of the NES, it has to be used with the NES RGB kit and what you get is the uh, the brains of the operation there, that little board which will take your RGB and convert it into component video. There is a uh, some header pins that will connect this little board to the NES RGB board. There is a headphone jack style mounting stocket that will go on the NES and there is a little breakout cable here that plugs into this socket like such. You can see it's got uh, four different points of connection and it breaks it out into RCA female sockets as you can see it's probably a good idea to keep by using this keeping the footprint small on your NES or Famicom or top loader or whatever you decide to put it into. So that's basically it. There's not a real lot to it and it shouldn't be a hard installation so I'm going to put it into a AV Famicom top loading NES and we'll see how it goes from there. Now the AV Famicom is open. This is my own one and I've already RGB modded this in the past so you can see E-Team's RGB board there. Now the one complication that's come up is that the RGB board here is an old revision. It is the NES RGB board. That's what it's labelled. Uh, see if I can get it on camera there, but NES RGB. So that is an old revision. The newer revisions, which would be easier to do this component mod, are labelled NES RGB 12. But nevertheless, we can still modify this to accommodate the component board. On the newer revisions, there is actually some holes in the board around here near my fingertip and I'm not counting the ones you see in a row there, ignore those, but there are some holes in the board here where you will insert the jumper pins. You split that up into a group of two and a group of three, solder them into the board where the holes would be normally around this point and then attach the NES component board. I'm going to actually have to directly solder wires to this RGB encoder chip and get them to this little component board, but I'll do that now anyway. It's still not going to be too hard to do. Now I have the component kit installed. It's not fully installed such as that the uh, headphone socket has been mounted into the console itself. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not actually going to run component. I'm quite happy to run RGB. I don't need component. However, it'll be interesting to see if the NES will output both RGB and component at the same time, in which case I may then panel mount that socket. And anyway, it has been installed. I should say that on ETIM's web store, where he's selling this gear, he does have instructions on installation, both for the old NES RGB board and the newer revisions. So if I can just show you what I've done here, might be a bit of a mess, but basically I've tapped into the red, green and blue, according to ETIM's instructions there from that video encoder chip. I've used red, green and blue wires to take that signal to the component board. I've also taken uh, the black wire there, ground, from the NES RGB board and plus 5 volts in that red one. And then I've hooked up the socket where it outputs everything. Um, it's taking blue from the component board, red from the component board, ground from the component board and it's taking its sync and brightness via that yellow wire back to the NES RGB board on the Y pad there which is Luma which will give the necessary information to complete the component signal that is now coming out of that socket. But basically now it's up to me to test it. Uh, I might just do regular RGB first and see if that's still working while I'm here in the shed where it's convenient to test. Righto, so the NES Wavy well, Famicom's hooked up to this SCART LCD here in the shed while it's convenient. So it's only through RGB, it's not through component. 
I'm just testing to see that it has, does actually still output RGB unhindered with having the component um, mod installed. So it looks like um, it looks like it's no problem. It's in RGB. Right, uh, we've got to really see what components like. That's really the purpose of the video. So I'm going to have to take the console inside, probably hook it up to the plasma via component. So now we'll test the component video output from the newly modded Famicom. So it's got a flash card inside. I'll play Mega Man 2. Righto, so it is working. There it is. Um, it's not in widescreen right now, but I can do that as such. But I prefer to leave it in 4.3. There's no scan line technology incorporated into the mod. I wouldn't really expect it to. The mod is the mod kit is 20 Australian dollars, so it's pretty economical. Um, I don't see any any real any problems at all running on this TV here. This is the Sony KVHR36. I've done a video on it before. It looks nice and bright. Um, there is one thing I have to make mention, and this is probably the most important thing in the whole video, is that uh, non-interlaced standard definition, such as coming out of the NES, 240p for NTSC, 288p for PAL, it is, what can we say, somewhat of an unorthodox type signal, and a lot of component accepting displays, such as CRTs or flat panel TVs, monitors, plasmas, LCDs don't necessarily accept uh, 240p. They may not display it at all, or they may have troubles, and you will see problems on screen resulting from the incompatibility. So that's really the most important thing to take out of the video, that you need to test your display device's ability to display 240 or 288p. I will put a link at the bottom of the video um, to a website with a procedure to test this. Uh, it's also linked on eTim's web shop. That's where I got it from, so it's probably best for you to do that. Um, I'll plug the NES Famicom up to my plasma in a moment and show you what happens with it running 240p over a component. But also, um, I mentioned before whether this mod might work uh, outputting RGB and component at the same time. Well, it does. Because there on the left is the Commodore monitor with SCART in the back, and that's coming from the NES, and we have component in the big Sony TV on the right. So for the last thing, I'll put it on the plasma and we'll see how it goes. I've got a change of plan. First, I'm going to go and use this LCD here in front of us. This is a Panasonic 32-inch LCD with component input. The Famicom is there, ready to go. So I'll turn it on now. Yeah. Okay, so it appears to be working. The mod is in force. Um, the the mod doesn't have any control over so much whether it's it forces the TV into widescreen or 4.3 or anything like that. It just displays basically to what the TV is already set at. Uh, the Panasonic is set to widescreen, 16 by 9. Um, the image is not quite full screen there is a slight border on the left side and on the right side the game is Mega Man 2 let's get a something with more color in it there it's probably hard to see in the camera but there is a left black border and a right black border the image is actually slightly shifted to the right as well just ever so slightly there are no scan lines the component mod does not generate any scan lines as such But it seems to be working fine. Uh, let's see what happens when we get hit. See what happens to the flashing Mega Man. That can be a problem for 240p processing over component. 
uh, he's fine. You may find that Mega Man may disappear altogether when he gets hit while he's flashing, or he may remain soldered like he is now. That can be an error that comes about from bad 240p processing, but here's the Panasonic handles it fine. So the only thing I can really fault at the moment is a slight shift to the right of screen. It's harder to tell with the CRT that we had on before, the Sony, because it probably set with some overscan anyway, so you'd never notice it. Anyhow, let's move on to a plasma now, Panasonic plasma. Oh, one other thing I should mention too, the the palette swap switch on this RGB mod, uh, it does actually also work into the component mod as well. So you can swap those, those palettes around as well. So that's something else handy to know about. Righto, let's go to the plasma. Finally ready to try the Famicom on the plasma here. This is a 50 inch Panasonic ST50 model from 2012. I've got it set to 4.3, so it's not widescreen. The borders are grey, you can make them black, but it doesn't matter for the moment. Righto, so I'll go back into that game from before, Mega Man 2. Load it up. Start it up, get that blue screen back. Righto, so the image is slightly shifted to the right again like it was on the LCD. The black left strip is slightly thicker than the right side. And also on this display, for some reason, we have a top we have some curvature there. You can see that block. It's crooked. It's curving. It runs along the entire top horizontal lines worth of those blocks. That didn't happen on the LCD from before. Didn't notice that on the Sony CRT TV from before either. I haven't exhaustively tested this TV for its 240p capability over the component lines. But it seems to have worked in the past, I think, on the PS2 and with an XRGB2 Plus and the Wii as well. Um, but again, as I said before, you need to really test your display device before you go investing in this mod here in case things don't work quite properly for you. So that's pretty much the end of the video. Um, I'll put the link up, as I said before, for the testing procedure. Um, for 240p over component and also I'll put up a link for my Facebook page that I've just about got around to putting up uh, making it public uh, on there I'm going to be selling a few RGB modded consoles you know Nintendo 64 and NES and so forth as well as some some other things to do with retro consoles so just check out that, that page I'll put a link there for that so that's uh, pretty much it for this video um, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time bye